Father, we thank you because you are calling upon us to trust you more and to obey you in that trust. And you have told us that there is no problem that will arise which you do not have a solution for if we can trust you. And Father, we pray that you will draw us into the closet with you this morning and we assure our hearts again that with you all things are possible. Amen. And that when you have called and you back up the call that you have given, that there is no reason for failure or defeat. Amen. Father, we pray that you will guide us and you open our understanding that we will know what you are telling us of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray that you will apply your word by your spirit into our hearts. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> From First Samuel chapter seventeen. We'll read part of the concluding verses. That tell us about the death of Goliath. First Samuel chapter 17 from verse 51. <clears throat> Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw the champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose, and shouted and pursued the Philistines, until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and spoiled their tents. No doubt you as a preacher and Christian worker, you have read or you have heard, or you have preached from this passage yourself before. But as you come to a passage like this, you must begin to ask yourself, why was this written? One, it was written for the Israelites themselves, that they will know the victories that God gave them in the past. And that will move them on to believe that if he gave that victory in the past, is able and willing to give such victory in the now, in the present. Not only that, the children of Israel were told to write about the memorials of God's goodness concerning them, so as to preserve for their own children. A number of times they were told when something dramatic, something spectacular happened to them that they will raise up a memorial that the children that are coming after them will be able to see that memorial and that will make them to ask questions and as they ask these questions they'll be able to tell them this is what the Lord did for us in the past again to reassure those children that the God of your fathers is the same God you are serving and what he did for our fathers he can do for us in the present generation but it goes beyond that for the church. The church has a great heritage. Because we're not trying to serve a God yet unknown. A God yet untried. A God yet unloved. That there were other people before us of a different dispensation. And of a different nationality that had proved the promises of God. And so these things are written, as we're told in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, 
that whatsoever things were written aforetime or before this time were written for our learning, that we, through comfort and patience of the scriptures, might have hope. That whatever we're going through today, that some people that followed God in the past went through the same thing. Well, the new generation, sometimes it looks surprising that whenever we face an enemy, we forget that such enemies have been faced before. Whenever we face a champion in the enemy camp, we forget that such champions have been faced before. And whenever there is a peculiar situation in our way, we forget that such peculiar situations were very, very common with the people that followed the Lord in the past. So these things are written for our own learning. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, we're told these were our examples. And they have been written down for us. So that again, with purpose of heart, we'll be able to follow this God that never lost a battle. And yet, this goes beyond what the average person might see on the surface. As you look at this uh, chapter, you'll find that Goliath, a champion of the enemy camp, he came to this battle with a lot of confidence, sure that he was going to win. And yet the Lord has preserved the story for us that the courage of the unbelieving champion is nothing to be reckoned with because they do not have the same rock that we have eternal hands are not underneath them and all the bragging and all the shouting and all the threatening they're like the foam of the sea they mean nothing at all of course they terrify the people that have not proved their god and the people that have not known their God to the point they will do exploits. But yet, they are nothing. For days, the children of Israel had feared. Feared this champion. Because of who he was. Because of what he said. Because of what he had done. What he had achieved. And today, this is the threefold thing that makes the believer but the untaught believer, unexperienced and immature believer to be afraid because of who the champion appears to be, who he is. The champion of the enemy camp. And because of what he has already achieved, what he has done. And people can count from generation to generation what Satan himself has done. And the proverbs and the languages and the vernaculars are full of the terror and the power and the destructive fire that the devil had caused in the past. Not only that, some champions in different places might be a witch doctor or might be a person possessing familiar spirit. And because of who he appears to be, or she appears to be, and because of what record he or she had said, of what he had done in the past, past achievements of the champion, because of that, the untaught, immature children of God, they're afraid, they panic. Not only that, but because of what he said, and because of what Satan has said, because he's a, he has always been a man of great swelling words. Since the time he said, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. He doesn't speak with moderate, humble, covered words. He speaks much more than he can accomplish, much more than he can do. That's part of his character. And the people of God always fear because of what they see and what they hear. And so the children of Israel feared so much. They trembled so much from the top to the least. Even Saul himself. When Saul came into the battle, 
he came with his armor and he came with his clothing prepared for battle but when he saw and when he heard and when he thought meditated on the things that this man had accomplished and he also saw all the Philistines behind him and these fellows said I defy not only Israel but the God of Israel and I challenge not only Saul the king but the whole nation of Israel and this man as he said that came in front unafraid of anyone or anything with his armor bearer before him bearing the armor the people ran they covered themselves they without fighting they already felt they had lost the battle sometimes before we even fight because of what we hear because of what we see because of what we're thinking about the achievement of that champion we feel that was the need to fight let's surrender before we even fight and we're not willing to even try who will try why try when you know that the end has been determined before the beginning but here came david but as david came you want to look beyond david to the one that was called the son of david that's the purpose the story was written that we will know all that david accomplished in the spiritual realm the son of david will eventually come and accomplish all that and much more and that all that david did that came into record among israel not only among israel but among all the philistines because you'll remember if you read the old testament properly when david had been driven away to Achish, and then the king over there was to fight against the children of israel and at this time it appeared that david was in exile and he said i will follow the people of uh, the people that i'm living with and go and fight in your battle with you all the elders of the philistines they called the king they said is this not david that won such a big victory for the children of israel and they sang that saul had killed his thousands and david had killed his ten thousands do you want him to go with us to battle he will not go the record of the victory of david was not only hidden in the archives with the children of israel but with even the philistines themselves they never forgot and i told you that's to look forward to the son of david coming and doing all that david did in the spiritual realm and now there is record record in the courts of heaven why because jesse and all the brothers of david never forgot the victory of that day the record was kept in the home of david and in the home of the son of david in heaven the record has been kept with the father and also with the angels not only that saul never forgot he inquired who is this lad from where is he and that means then that the record of the victory of the son of david that record is in the church and should be in the church and every israelite knew in fact the trophies were kept the spoil of the war was kept that he brought the head of goliath back to jerusalem the headquarters to show openly the defeat of the champion of the enemies and then he kept the sword with which he cut off the head of goliath so that anytime somebody like goliath came across the way all he needed to do was to look at that sword a remembrance of what has already been achieved 
by the covenant people of God. And the record should be in the church of what Christ, the son of David, did against the champion of the Philistines. Not only that, the record was with the Philistines themselves. And you need to understand that when Jesus had authority, it was not only recorded in heaven or recorded in the church, even among the cohorts of Satan, the messengers and emissaries of Satan, the record is with them that he spoiled principalities and powers and that he made it an open show of them and triumphed over them in it. That the son of David did not win a private battle that nobody knew about, but that in heaven and on earth and even underneath the earth among the demonic host, the record is there that Jesus Christ, the son of David, won the never-to-be-forgotten battle and the victory. And now it's for the children of God. Goliath is dead. The children of Israel, they trembled when that man was still alive, alive and active, alive and bragging. Everybody was weak. There was no desire in anyone to go ahead and do anything until David came. Why David? Because God had anointed and appointed him. It's not so much because of David's courage. It's not so much because of David's peculiar characteristics. But the appointment as well as the anointing. And didn't the word of God say that I have set my king upon the hill of Zion. And I will say unto thee, this day have I begotten thee, thou art my son. It's the appointment that God himself, wanting to bring the kingdom, all the kingdoms of the world, on Jesus Christ, that it will be fulfilled, that the government shall be upon his shoulder. And this will be the sure mercies of David forever. That's why he was appointed to destroy and to put to naught all the cohorts of the enemy and of Satan. And because it will be fulfilled on David, that this is the appointed anointed king. That's why he came at this time. He came and he was despised. Even of his own brother. What is it you have come to do here? This is not the place for you. What do we read of the son of David? That even his brethren believed him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. And yet to as many as received him. As David began to talk to the people. Saying. What shall be done for this person? That will defeat this fellow. Some people accepted him. And he took him to Saul. And while he got to Saul, he told him, why not try this, the plan of the enemy? That after the son of David had come, Jesus Christ the Messiah, as he came, then the devil tried to give an armor and said, you'll achieve what you want to achieve. The taking of all the kingdoms of the world and the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy on you, if you will do this. And he said, no. Man must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not by bread alone, but eventually in his own armor that he was familiar with. He went across and he defeated Goliath and the son of David has gone to the appointed place in due time and he has defeated the devil and he said now shall the prince of the world be judged and I if I be lifted up because it's that time that the prince of this world will be judged 
and the death blow prophesied and promised from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that I will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy heel it shall bruise he will bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel it was that time that Jesus accomplished it and having tasted the flesh and the blood with us he has destroyed him that has the power of death even the devil and so David cut off the head of Goliath as they cut off the head of Goliath then the children of Israel shouted and the Philistines themselves, with eyes wide open, they saw what became of their champion. Fear came into them, and they fled in terror. And it is already known to all the demons, all the evil spirits, all the witches, all the wizards, that Jesus Christ defeated their champion. And because it is known, they fear and it's on record and every time they go up they go to check up their record they find it in the record like that somebody sometimes is taken mistakenly they don't know his identity he happens to have been saved washed in the blood of jesus but they kidnap him and take him to a shrine and then they look at their instruments wanting to sacrifice that person and their instrument read untouchable <laughs> and they ask him are you a church man he says yes i'm a christian what type of christian then he mentions the church where christ is exalted where christ is honored where christ is savior then they shout they drive him out and then they ask the other fellow why did you bring a man like this they saw the record. And because of that, there is terror. They know it. And we know it. And God knows it. And all the descendants of the Philistines know it. And it's not a hidden secret. The champion, the devil, the head of the Philistines, that he is dead. And because we know it, that's the reason for the panic among the people, the Philistines. Not only that, Israel became courageous with renewed faith immediately. And we have read already in the account that after they knew and learned of Goliath's death, they ran after them. And those Philistines, they ran away from them because the news had been broken do you know that when the news was fresh in the early church when people had not forgotten when everybody knew when the romans knew and also the jews knew and the apostles knew because paul the apostle said manifestly christ was crucified before you you saw it and you saw the end, the chief aim, and the purpose of it. When that information was fresh and new, there was no fear in the church. None at all. Demons were cast out without any effort. The sick was healed without any fasting. And victories were won without much ado. Because the news was fresh. But with the passing of the years the church began to sleep not only began to sleep began to forget the news of the death of goliath the news of the defeat of satan and eventually the philistines became strong because of the ignorance of the church but we're digging up the news again. Yes. That Goliath was never resurrected after he died. The champion is gone. 
and is gone forever. Amen. And the devil has been defeated. There's no renewed strength for the devil. As defeated as he was on the day Jesus was crucified, Satan is still as defeated like that. As defeated as he was, when the news was fresh, Satan is still as defeated. And that is why every child of God must know and hear this, that there is no fear again. The children of Israel must again rise up courageously with renewed faith. They pursued after the Philistines and defeated them. But we find that in the history of the children of Israel, this wasn't the only time when the death of a champion was recorded in the Bible. Haman was another tyrant, another individual that set himself up that he will annihilate, wipe out, destroy completely the children of Israel, but with another type of methodology. And the decree had been passed out that it will be done. Mordecai had the news and also all the Jews at Shushan, they had the news that the end had come for, it, for the Jews. And everybody was already broadcasting it. In all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, the news went abroad that on a particular set day, all the Jews were to be killed. And Mordecai came to Esther and said, Are you still in the palace? It's danger. And Esther said, there's nothing I can do. Oh, Mordecai said, there's something you will do. And you have to do something. Do you know whether you have come to the kingdom as because of a time like this? And he said, go to the Jews. Tell them to fast for me. I also and my maidens will fast. If I perish, I perish. And she fasted three days and three nights. And went to the king and invited the king for a meal with Haman, the champion of the enemies of the people of God. And eventually, Haman wanted to set the gallows. He even set it for Mordecai. But eventually, he was defeated. And the king heard about it, of the plans. And he hanged Haman on the gallows that he had wanted to hang Mordecai. I want you to see part of the story. In Esther chapter 7. Esther chapter 7. Verse 10. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath pacified. Look at chapter 8. On that day, did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther, the queen? And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. In verse 5, and he said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his sight, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman the son of Amedatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews which are in all the king's provinces. After the death of the champion, you can request for whatever you want. After the defeat of Satan, there is now the opportunity and the privilege for you that whatsoever you ask believing, it shall be given unto you. Already Haman had written this decree that they said was unchangeable. Whenever any decree was written, 
in the kingdom of Ahasuerus, you don't touch it again. You don't modify it again. And Haman had got the seal of the king to seal that sin for the destruction of the Jews. But now Haman was dead. The chief enemy of the people of God. And Esther said, and Esther said, you know, even a woman can talk to the king. Even a sister can be authoritative with the king of kings after Haman is dead. Because now, with the death of that tyrant, of that enemy, the opportunity comes. The barrier is broken. And you can come to the king and say, this is what you are requesting. And what did Esther request? That a letter be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman. Have there been some decrees devised by Satan in your life? Devised by evil powers, powers of darkness in your life? Now that the champion enemy is dead, now that Satan has been defeated and his power destroyed, isn't it possible for you to request that another decree coming from the throne of the universe will be written on your behalf that will reverse all the letters and all the authority and all the words of Satan? You can. And everything that Satan had devised or decided in the past, now, because of his defeat, you can ask for the reverse or reversal of all that. Then in verse 7, Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you. If you are destroyed now, it's your fault. If you are defeated now, it's your fault. After the death of Haman, write as it pleases you, as it liketh you. If you abide in my word, and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be given unto you. For ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do it. Verse 8. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and it shall be done, that the joy may be full. That if you ask anything from the Father in my name, I will do it. And the king told Esther and Mordecai, and said, Write as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it of the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name, the one you are now going to write this morning. For the writing which is written in the king's name, for the decree which is given out in the king's name. Isn't Jesus king? Isn't he Lord? For God has highly exalted him and given him a name above all names that are the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Not only of things on earth but of things of beings in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth. And it says here that for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse because the enemy had died the arch enemy had been defeated the wicked plan had been foiled now the Jews were free they were bold with new authority they were exalted and they were honored in verse 15 
and Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel. Because now that we are washed in the blood of Jesus, he has made us kings and priests unto our God. And it says, Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in the royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. This is a good day. And this is a good day for the church. When you know and you realize now that Goliath is dead, Haman is dead, and all the messengers and cohorts of the devil, they're defeated and destroyed. Why don't you live as a king? Haven't given us this abundant grace that we may reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. And here it says in verse 16, And the Jews had light, gladness, and joy, and honor. And in every province, and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came. Understand? It wasn't actually the king's decree. It was the decree of Esther and Mordecai. But reaching in the king's name. And when you pray in that name, it's like the prayer of Jesus himself. It's like he himself were praying. When Esther and Mordecai wrote that new decree in the king's name and sealed it everybody that saw that they thought the king himself actually wrote it and every time you pray in the name of jesus the prayer is like jesus christ himself is pleading the, before the throne and is also commanding your command in the name of jesus is like the command of jesus himself to those demons and evil spirits they can see a difference and so that's why it says in every province, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment came and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews <laughs> when they saw the victory, <laughs> when they saw the authority, when they saw it was a new day, they said, I think I ought to become a Jew. And when the church will rise up once again, in the authority of the new decree, of the new authority that comes in the name of Jesus that defeated and destroyed the devil, then you will understand that people will, don't, will not know why are they sinners. Why don't they become Christians? Why don't they give their lives to the Lord? And it says, For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Moses ran away from Egypt because Pharaoh was after him. But after his death, God called him and said, Moses, come back. Enter into your ministry. They that seek your life, they are dead. When the champion of the enemies when is dead, it brings a gateway, an open door for the people that run away into exile to come back and take over their ministry. Because the champion is dead. Jesus Christ had just been born. And Herod heard about it. And because of that, he wanted to kill that little baby. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. And an angel warned Joseph and said, Take Mary and the child and go away for some time from this jurisdiction. And he went away. But eventually, Herod was dead. They always die. But the trouble is that the people of God never have the information when they die. And they keep on fearing the dead Herod. Or the dead Pharaoh. But the information came. Joseph, he is dead. Who is that? The only one that spells fear in your heart. 
terror in your heart. He is dead. Go back to the land of Israel, into God's heritage. When we realize that the champion, the devil, is destroyed, is defeated, his power is nullified, you'll go back into God's heritage. And Joseph took Mary and the child and came back. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, Herod was breathing threatenings against the church, wanting to destroy the church. And he even imprisoned Peter. But God brought Peter out of that prison. But in that same chapter, Herod was arrayed, a terror to everybody. And then he spoke with great words of oratory. And the people said, this is God. Why don't we begin to worship him? Because he's speaking not like man, but like a God. And in his pride, he accepted it. And an angel came and smote him, and he died. Herod died, and then the Bible says, and the word of God grew and multiplied. It's time for the work to grow and multiply. Amen. Because the news has come, Goliath is dead. Or are you still sick? Or are you oppressed? Or are you timid? Or are you drawn into a corner? Hiding yourself. As if Goliath is still alive. Come out of your shelter. Come out of the hiding. And come out with renewed faith. The one you are fearing is dead already. Let's rise up and pray. A new dawn has come upon our hearts. you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our God and our Father, we remember that when Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples went to look for him among the dead. But they were told that he is risen. In the same way, some of us fear the devil as if he is still very powerful. But this day you have told us again the truth. That the power of the devil has been stripped off from him. Yes. And we need not fear him anymore in Jesus' name. Yes. And Lord, we know the same thing has happened to sicknesses. Yes. The power of sicknesses have been broken. Yes. And there is no way any disease can destroy a child of God. Yes. Because in our body, in our soul... We have that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Yes. That is why, O oh Lord, from this morning, we are asking that the truth will be deep-rooted and deep-seated in our hearts in Jesus' name. Yes. Lord, we are asking that the revelation of this truth, not just to be in our heads, not just to be the consciousness in our mind, but Father, it will be a reality in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. When we stand before a demon-possessed person, we are not seeing that demon as powerful. We are seeing Jesus Christ who has bruised the head of the devil. And with that authority, as we command, the demons must come out in Jesus' name. Amen. And we, when we stand before the one that is sick, Oh Lord, no matter what kind of sickness, Jesus has said it is finished. And as we command in the name of Jesus, that sickness must bow in Jesus' name. And when we stand before any mountain, when we stand before any problem, when we stand before any situation, oh God, we remember our master, our great captain. He has already gotten the victory for us. And ours is to open our mouth and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Oh Lord, from this day, we will say so. Amen. We will say what Calvary has done. Amen. We will say what Jesus has purchased for us. Amen. We will say what heaven has signed and sealed. Amen. And it shall be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Lord, we request from this day that every one of us will possess our possessions. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Father, faith comes by hearing. Yeah. And what we hear, the word of God. Yeah. The victory that Jesus has already got for us. Yeah. And Lord, I am asking this day that our faith will be charged ten times more than before as we have known this truth in Jesus' name. Yeah. Faith to get to the mountains. Faith to possess the mountain. Yes. Lord, I believe that this is what Caleb would have known. That already the people in the land, Rahab and others, they are saying that your fear is upon us. But the other ten spies, they didn't know that. Oh, we didn't see the giants as such. We saw our Lord and our God who has already gone before us. And he has put our fear in their heart. Therefore, let us go and possess that land. Amen. Lord, we know that Caleb possessed that land. Amen. Joshua possessed that land. Amen. And as we go, we shall possess the land in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We know you have done it. Amen. And Lord, we are praying that in our churches where we have been, there might have been a lot of stories. This is the land that eateth up the inhabitants. Oh God, we reverse it this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as we get there now, as we march around, the walls of Jericho has fallen in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you because we know you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.